we're so mindful of so many that can't be here, Father, that have a desire to be here. And we pray you continue to be with them in the ailments that they're dealing with and, and continue to, uh, to give them strength. Help us, Father, to always know the, the needs of our brothers and sisters around us. Give us the opportunities, Father, to, to serve them and to, to help them through whatever challenges they might face. And Father, as we uh, come together, we're, we're thankful that we have your word revealed to us. We're thankful that we live in a time that we can study your will and your word and know your will for our lives. And Father, we pray that you guide us as we continue to study about your, your son, Jesus. Uh, Father, we, we're so moved as we see the, the life he lived on our behalf. And we just pray that you help us as we try to transform our lives into, into his image that we might be more exemplify uh, his nature in our own lives, Father, that we might lead others to you. And Father, we pray that all that we do this day brings you glory and that we do it all in a pleasing manner. And it's through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, we uh, are continuing our study uh, uh, in the life of Christ. And as I've shared with you before, this year is, this year is really moving fast. It's hard to believe we're middle of October already. And uh, in our study, uh, as we committed this entire year to really do a more intense study of the life of Christ, maybe than many of us have done before, and hopefully that's been the, the case for you. Uh, and I appreciate all your feedback and all your own study. Uh, and so I encourage you, and I know it's not always the, the easiest thing in an auditorium class to get feedback, but I appreciate your comments and feedback at any time. I want to encourage that. So uh, I don't want this to be a lecture class. I know you don't want it to be either. So, but you know, I can, I can talk the whole time if I need to, but uh, that's not the intention of our class. And uh, so I want, I want you to feel, uh, I want you to feel open to add to our discussion. And, uh, and even if I don't ask for it, I hope you always know, I encourage that feedback. Uh, as we move forward in our study. And it's really, uh, the next few weeks, are, I think, are really going to be challenging in our study. Uh, we're dealing with the last week of the life of Christ, uh, and it's really going to be impactful. As we focus on this, hopefully not just the time when we're together, but in our own study, uh, in our homes, that we're focusing on uh, the last week our Lord lived on this earth. And there's a lot of, uh, it's interesting that some commentators have said nearly one third of the gospel account is spent in the last eight days of Jesus' life. Now think about that. Nearly one third of the gospel accounts are spent in the last eight days of Jesus' life. One commentator said of the chapters which deal with the actual ministry of Jesus, almost 40% are devoted to his experiences in those closing days. It's a lot that happens that last week of Christ's life. Uh, almost half of the 21 chapters of John are devoted to events that occur after Jesus' arrival in Bethany. Uh, and we're going to talk about Jesus' arrival back into Bethany today. So there's a lot that happens in the last week of Christ's life. And we're not going to be able to touch on all that uh, in our study the next few weeks. So we're going to try to cover, you know, as much as, as, as we can in our class, you know, try to tie, tie things together in our in, in our sermons uh, on Sunday morning, and Greg's helping us on Sunday night, so we can get so we can cover as much of that material as we can, which is just some really, uh, really uh, uh, moving uh, material. So we get the context of where where we're at and what's been going on. We see uh, if you see Bethany, which is just below Jerusalem, which is just left of the Dead Sea, Bethany and Jerusalem, Bethany. To get an idea of the scale, Bethany is about two miles away from Jerusalem. So we've seen the case to where Jesus had come to Bethany. He'd healed Lazarus in Bethany, raised Lazarus from the dead. Then he leaves Bethany, goes to Ephraim, which Ephraim, you see, is north of Jericho. That's the wilderness area. Jesus goes off into the wilderness area. And then he's going to be journeying back towards Jerusalem. We saw that in the rich man, uh, the rich young ruler last week we studied about. It was when Jesus is kind of on his way back to Jerusalem. But he'll go to Bethany, uh, and he spends his time in Bethany before he'll enter into Jerusalem again for his final visit to Jerusalem. So and we're going to find we're going to find that today that Jesus comes back, uh, comes back to Bethany after uh, departing and going into the wilderness. Uh, one thing I want to touch on before we uh, move into the text today, 
<clears throat> is last week, remember we'd studied about the rich young ruler and there was a lot of really good comments about the rich young ruler. Mike and Greg and others made some really good comments. And there was a passage I had at the end of that study that we didn't get to touch on that I think is really important in context to the comments that we were getting from Greg and Mike. Because you remember the rich young ruler, he had done all these things that in the law that he was supposed to do. And he's, he's told Jesus, I've done all these things. And what's Jesus telling that he needed to do? Yeah, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and follow me. And what was his reaction? He went away sorrowful because he what? He had much possessions. Jesus knew that the riches was standing in his way for really being the disciple that he needed to be, right? So, and we had that discussion about, wow, it's really tough when, when Jesus asked somebody just to sell everything you have. Now, there's a context of the first century that Jesus actually called full-time disciples. He did that with, with his 12 apostles. And Peter, James, and John were fishing, and they were told to leave their fishing business and just follow me. They left and followed. We talked about how tough that would be to leave your family and do that, even though we know they'd come back and see their family on occasion, but they would travel with Jesus. So Jesus called full-time disciples. Not everybody left everything they had. We're still disciples, but there was a purpose for some of them to be full-time disciples, particularly the apostles. But one thing that's interesting in this, in context to that, this is in the context of what we read. Peter makes a response after the discussion of how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, after he's had this conversation with a rich young ruler, remember we talked about that last week. Well, Peter makes a response that says, Peter began to say to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. Now, this is after the conversation with the rich young ruler. Now, in Matthew's account there, Peter actually, add, Matthew adds additional information for us where Peter says, what then shall we have? Okay. So Peter's saying, he's listening to this conversation that the rich man needed to sell all he had and give to the poor, and then he'll have treasure in heaven. And Peter's thinking, we have left everything. What are we going to get? What are we going to get? Now, we know they didn't understand the idea of the kingdom. But listen to Jesus' response, and I think it's important and maybe help us in context of this. Jesus' response to Peter is, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life the many who are first will be last and the last shall be first what's jesus telling peter about giving things up for him it'll come back to you a hundredfold so when we're thinking about man he's asking them to do something tough when he asked them to give up everything they had Jesus is saying, anybody that gives up all their stuff for me, it's going to come back to you a hundredfold. So when we think, man, that's a hard thing to do. But Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you to be destitute because I'm going to take care of you. If you give up on my sake, for the gospel's sake, you'll be rewarded a hundredfold and be blessed beyond this life. Obviously, we know the importance of that. But there seems some indication that the Lord will provide. And that great idea of faith to be able to just empty and be willing to say, it all belongs to you, Father, but I'm going to follow you. So I think that's an important aspect of it as we're talking, as he calls these others. But he's saying, you're going to be rewarded a hundredfold. Bill? We see and realize and they're trying to say there's been a lot of people that have done that. We say more than we ever expected. And Bill, you've got a lot of years experience of that too, don't you? I mean, those of you who have experienced that in your life and you've seen it come back hundredfold, huh, Bill? Hundredfold. I appreciate you sharing that. And you think about us as as Christians, and I know those of us who travel to Honduras and we've done, and many of you other have traveled. If you just travel and, and you go worship somewhere else because you're gone on the weekend, you know what? You got brothers and sisters in that location, everywhere, everywhere. 
Our you family is extended in it. What'd you say, Paul? Yeah, Paul and Karen should know. They're gone all y'all travel all the time. <laughs> but I mean, isn't that a great concept to think about? You're not giving up, you're gaining. And we always worry about the idea of giving up, but God's saying, don't think of it as giving up. Think about it as what you're going to gain. What you're going to gain. I think our human nature, I know it is for me, is thinking about what I'm going to give up, what I'm going to lose. It's not about losing, is it? It's about gaining. And if we can change our concept, our mind, our mindset to think about, I'm not giving up, I'm gaining. And that's what it is in following Christ. We're gaining so much more than we're ever giving up. But we live in a society, it's hard for us to see it that way. And he even mentions here, you're going to have persecution, but you're still going to gain so much more than what you're going to lose, even in the face of persecution. Even in the face of persecution. So, any thoughts or, or comments on that? I didn't want that to go unsaid because we really, I mean, that's a hard statement that he told the rich young ruler. You know, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And Peter's wondering, we've given up everything. What are we getting out of this? And Jesus is telling us, you know, you're not giving up. You're going to get, you're going to get rewarded for it. So, yeah, Greg. So I get the impression when I read that about the rich young ruler that a big part of his identity was tied up with his riches. He He's introduced as the rich young ruler. And I think we at the same time, we find a lot of our identity tied up in our possessions and our wealth or success or power or whatever we spend our time accumulating. And that's what he's really asking you to give up is put yourself last and put me first. And that's that's harder than going and selling a no car. You know, I mean, we're talking mm -hmm. about redefining who you are. Great point. Yeah, Greg mentioned that to me after class last week. So I'm glad I got a chance for you to bring that out because it's an excellent point. It's his identity. His identity was in his wealth. Where's our identity? You know, a great point, Greg. Thanks. So gave me a, another good reason to bring this passage out. So Greg got to share that great concept about that's where his identity was. So good comment. Appreciate that. Other thoughts or comments? Yes, Sue? Wasn't he raised, though, with those kind of ideas that wealth, uh, was very important along with yeah, we talked about how they thought if you were wealthy, you were blessed by God and you were in God's favor. See a little bit of yeah. Why he... yeah, and you see how much we're dealing with the life of Christ. How much is Jesus having to change a whole way of thinking, a whole mindset in their hearts, isn't he? Because they've been raised this way. And we see that in our world today. People are raised with these concepts and these ideas, and it's hard to change hearts, isn't it? And we see it in Jesus' day. It is hard to change hearts when you've been raised a certain way, you've been taught a certain way. How do you change your hearts? It's got to be through Jesus that we can change hearts through his word. But Jesus was dealing with that. And we see what a challenge it is for people. Today, you give up everything, house, family, and everything, and you go out today. Yeah. Well, and, and there's a context there to where we're not asked to give all that up and, and we're asked to not allow it to be first before God. He may, there may be times, we're, but we're all stewards. We look at this, but we're all stewards. Everything we own belongs to God. He's letting us use it. And then he may ask us, you need to use this for this purpose from time to time. He, and we need to be willing to use it for that purpose from time to time because we're just stewards of what God's given us. So I think... Uh, I just think it's an important passage to look at after we talked about uh, that aspect of giving up all. So, Greg, I mean, not Greg, I'm still stuck with Greg. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> yeah. The, the parable of the different talents that was given to each one and what they did with them, you know, that's a lesson uh, also. Yeah. Use what God's given you, huh? At whatever level it is, we all have different talents and abilities, don't we? And we use what God's given us. Great, great point, Paul. Do what, John? We're all different. And we're all different. We're all different. Okay. I just wanted us to tie that together. So today, we're going to be dealing with preparation for a feast. And I want to give us a little background material as Jesus, when Jesus comes into Bethany and kind of tell you what's going on. Exodus 23 tells us there's three major feasts that the Jews have. And Exodus lines it out three times a year. He's talking to the Jews three times a year. You shall celebrate a feast to me. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, which is the Passover. 
for seven days. It was a seven day feast. Passover is a seven day feast. For seven days, you were to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the Mount of Abib. For in it, which is around our April, for in it you came out of Egypt and none shall appear before me empty handed. Also, you shall observe the feast of the harvest, which is Pentecost the first fruits of your labors from what you sow in the field. Also the feast of the end gatherings was the feast of the tabernacles, which we've studied about at the end of the year, when you gather in the fruit of your labors from the field, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. So we're going to talk about the crowds coming into Jerusalem for Passover. This gives us some context because Jesus is going to be on his way to Jerusalem. He's going to go to Bethany. We're going to talk about what occurs while he's in Bethany this morning. And crowds are coming to Jerusalem. And this is why, because they are all required to go to Jerusalem for these three major feasts. So there's going to be thousands of people come into Jerusalem for the feast day. I've heard now your commentaries, I don't want what they might say. I've heard anywhere from 250,000 up to a million people. I mean, there's a lot of people. I mean, you can see a wide range of what scholars speculate. But regardless, there's a lot of people. And it's because it's a major feast. It's a major feast. And this is a feast. Not all their feasts had to be done in Jerusalem, but this one has to be done in Jerusalem. So that's why we're going to see the crowds are coming to Jerusalem. So we look at our text today, John 11, introducing our text. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. Okay, so they're coming from Galilee, which is north of Judea, the region of Judea. They're coming from all over. All the Jews are converging on Jerusalem for Passover. And they're coming early. They're already coming. It's a week-long deal, but they're coming because they need to be purified. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Verse 56, so, so they were seeking for Jesus and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now, the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so that they might seize him. Okay, remember when Jesus had left uh, Bethany after raising Lazarus from the dead, the, the press of the people, we see how the Sadducees, Pharisees, they'd all come together and decided Jesus has to die. We've looked at those passages. Jesus goes to the wilderness area. They don't know where he is. So they basically put out the leaders, the religious leaders that put out this word that if anybody knows where this Jesus is, you need to tell us. Now, some commentators even say that they probably had, which they would do, they would post writings like we would say, not a wanted poster per se, but they would post things all around the town. We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Very possibility that they did that because the word was out that they were looking for Jesus. The leaders wanted to know, if you know where he is, you need to tell us because we're looking for him. So all the people know the animosity. All the people know what Jesus is dealing with and that the leaders are after him. So the question comes up to some of them that what? What about Jesus at the feast? Is he even going to come? Yeah, Gloria, you think he'll come? They know, they know what's waiting for him when he gets there. They know they're all laying in wait for him. And some of those who have come in, the pilgrims have come in going, do you think he'll come? Do you think he'll show up this year? Do you think he'll come to the feast? And so we see that Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, somebody characterized what was Jesus' relationship with, with Lazarus. Good friends. Good friends. And who else? Mary and, Mary and Martha, who were what relationship to Lazarus? Sisters. Sisters. There was a close connection there. Jesus would come to Bethany, and that's where he would stay when he was going to Jerusalem. So before he goes to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, he comes to Bethany, and he comes to see him. Mike? I was going to say, backing up just a little, as much yeah. as they wanted Christ, Jesus, you'd think they'd offer a bounty because money talks. People are greedy. And, and they, they will give Judas a little bounty, won't yeah, they? But, but it seemed like they would have then. Exactly. That's a good point, Mike. You know, uh, at this point, they're just kind of, hey, we want to know where he is. 
because of the crowds. Remember, we will see pastors because of the crowds. They didn't want to take him at certain times because of the crowds. So it's like we want to know where he is. Just just if you know where he is, we need to know. We know what's going on and probably under, the people have an underlying idea of what's going on. But, yeah, that's an interesting point. And, and they'll they'll wind up paying a bounty you know, to Judas. But that is a good point. So we see Jesus is going to come to uh, to Bethany. Let's talk about this this uh, the purification aspect of this. Is why people they come in early for the for the feast and they begin to flock in early because they have to go through a purification before the Passover. You have to be sanctified, purified to be able to participate in Passover. And we know all the laws they have for purification. Basically. Uh, the cleansing, the washings that they go through. Just some passages that reflect that. Exodus 19, this is when God is telling Moses he's going to come down from Mount Sinai. You need to have the people prepared. They need to wash their garments. It's like in God's presence, you need to be totally clean. And that was a cleansing that they would do in that passage. Second Chronicles 13, 18 through 19. This is actually a passage about them partaking of the Passover and this passage in Second Chronicles reads, For a multitude of the people, even many from Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover otherwise unprescribed. For Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of the, his fathers, though not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary. Hezekiah prays for them because they partake of the Passover and they haven't been rightly purified. He's hoping God will have mercy on them because that was just not appropriate because of their purification laws. So when we see that, uh, when we see here in, uh, in Matthew, in John eleven fifty five, 55, now the Passover of the Jews was near. Many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. So they get there early and they start this purification process. Now, I share this with you. This is interesting. Uh, this is from the, uh, the early Christian history, uh, org website, an article on ancient Christians and cleanliness. Washings were so prevalent that these, they're called mikvahs, actually a collection of waters, Hebrew word for collection of water, mikvahs, all over Jerusalem, all, all around the, the area around the temple. And this writing, this historical writing says this, mikvah, mikvah purification was required of all Jews before they could enter the temple or participate in major festivals. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims converged to Jerusalem for Passover and other major feasts. 100 mikvahs attesting to the need for water purification before entering into the temple rites have been found by Hebrew University University's Benjamin Mazur around the wall adjacent to Herod's temple. Mikvahs resembling large bathtubs or small garden ponds have been found in Jericho and elsewhere in Israel. These were almost like we would call baptistry. I mean, that's what I think about when I see these pools. These mikvahs were large enough you could bathe in and they would do full body purifications in these to be purified before God. And so there'd be hundreds of these mikvahs Around, he talks about in this historical setting, around uh, around the uh, temple, that they would be there and have to take time for these thousands of people to use these mikvahs to purify themselves because they had to be purified three or four days before the Passover feast to have time for all these people to be purified to be able to participate in the Passover. So we see seven days before the Passover, the crowds are already coming in. The purifications have started. So you get an idea of just the magnitude of the people that are coming into Jerusalem, the, the things they have to prepare themselves for uh, to be able to participate in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Passover itself. Any, uh, any thoughts or comments, Mike? Uh, just a question. Did, were these like springs or were they didn't need to be emptied and filled? No, some were some were spring fed, some were spring fed, but then some would also be filled uh, from the other pools. Water would be transported in, but a lot of them were spring fed, from what I read. A lot of them were. Uh, the ones around the temple were. The ones around the temple were. Uh, yeah. Because they had to do it before they went in. Had to do it before they went in. And they so. Put on clean clothes. Yeah, yeah, it was a full body purification, 
and uh, it's an interesting aspect. I mean, it's, you know, we could really do an intense study about the importance of baptism and <laughs> God's requirement that we be immersed they knew about immersion. The Jews understood purification and the idea of being purified and cleansed to stand before God. Interesting, there's a lot of study you can do into that. Baptism is not such a foreign idea from the Jewish concept of purification and uh, a long time. So that's an interesting study in itself. The people that want to complain about being immersed in baptism, this is something that has been God's purification idea, the idea of being cleansed before God is a is an old concept. Thoughts or comments? Did I see a hand? This reminds me of that saying that cleanliness is godliness. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I wonder where that came from, Susan. That's a great point. <laughs> cleanliness is godliness because that was the very point here is you got to be pure to be before God. That's a great point. I wonder where that originated. That would be an interesting study in itself. It may have originated from this kind of a thought. Great point. Karen? I don't know, this is very interesting right here because you know so many people that think that you really don't have to be baptized. They may be baptized, it was just some other act that they did that they were saved before um, they were baptized. And this seems to kind of solidify. There's a lot of significance. I mean, we could really just do a study. I'd really like to do an intense study on just that aspect. And there's a lot of Everett Ferguson, other church historians have written a lot about these cleansings in the in in the old times and the significance, but the idea that God requires a cleansing, and uh, you know, you think about that in our realm as Christians, He doesn't He doesn't change. It's but we knew a different concept of the cleansing, don't we? Great point, Karen. It really. So I want to share that with you because I think that's very interesting. It's things that we don't hear about all those pools and all the cleansings, the immersions that they were doing. Uh, to be able to be purified for the Passover, Mike? Google. Tell me what it says. The statement may be another one of those made famous by Benjamin Franklin. Okay. Or Richard Zalmanac. That cleansing this is next. And Benjamin time. Franklin was a Bible reader, so who knows? He could have got the idea from something he read. So I think you guys are right on target. I appreciate that comment. Good comments. So other thoughts or comments? Yeah, Karen. Back in when they had the tabernacle and they moved it and everything, but the priest had to wash before they could enter into the. Oh, yeah. The priest had to wash. There was, I mean, we're dealing with one aspect of cleansing before the Passover, but the priests were constantly cleansing, weren't they, Karen? They were cleansing for anything they did before God. Yeah. Is that, you know, cleanliness is godliness. They were, you know, they were having to clean to do anything for God. So it's a great point you raised, Susan. So. Yeah, great, great thoughts there. So try to get the overall context. So this is this is what's going on. And this is the environment that Jesus is going to come into Jerusalem. OK, this is the environment he's going to come into. A lot of hustle and bustle, a lot of national pride, because they really thought their king would come at the time of a feast. So it's caught. It's why they're always on edge during this. And then all they've heard about Jesus, it's all coming together. Now they hear the leaders are looking for him. I mean, there's just a lot of perfect storm coming together. Paul? One study we went through years ago somewhere that uh, when the scribes were uh, writing the, and they come to the word God, Jehovah, Yahweh, whichever. They couldn't write it. They could not write it without getting up and going to cleansing themselves, then come back and just write that word. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that's how holy his name is. And they had to write it a different way because they couldn't even speak it or even write it. So that's why they came up with Jehovah and Yahweh. They found different ways to write it because they couldn't even write it. It's how holy God is. Great point. And so we understand why is purification important? We've forgotten just how holy God is. I mean, we, we brought God down to our level, he did come to our level in giving his son and living on earth, but we've left him here and he's still, he's still holy, you know? And, uh, and, and I think that's a great point you raised. We, we miss that point sometimes. Yeah. Other thoughts or comments, just, Mike? That what he said just makes you really cringe when you hear people who use the Lord's name in vain. And man, isn't that true? true that if I'm you really understand, I want to say, man, don't do that. I know if you really understand who God is, 
No, don't ever do that. You, you can see why. Write it's a, his name without taking a bath. You better leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> we and we've missed that aspect, have we, Mike? We, we, yeah. yeah, we played it down. We played it down. We played it down. Good, good comments. Appreciate that. That's it. Exactly, Paul. That's exactly what we've done. Okay. I've given you a lot of background material, so let's look at the text that I want us to look at this morning for, for a few minutes. He's going to Bethany, and something happens in Bethany. John 12, 1 through 4. Uh, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there. And Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now they come to, uh, he comes to Bethany, and he goes to the house. Now uh, we're told uh, it's the house of Simon and another uh, in, in a parallel uh <clears throat> parallel uh, Mark. I actually have it up here. I was looking to see where it was. Mark tells us it's in the house of Simon, a leper. Now, in Mark in Luke 7, we studied about Jesus in the home of Simon, and a woman comes and anoints his feet, and, and it sounds similar, but it's two different stories. Simon before was a Simon the Pharisees in Luke 7, and it was a sinful woman. She was, and they got on her because of her uh, immoral character. This is Simon a leper, and it's going to be Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Martha. And she's going to be criticized for a different reason, is what's going to occur here in this occasion. Uh, who is they? They gave a dinner. Now, they're in the home of Simon the leper. Simon is probably, most speculate that Simon is probably a leper that Jesus has cleansed. Obviously, he's not still a leper because what? They couldn't be around him, and he couldn't be in his home. So most likely he's a leper that Jesus has cleansed. Now, it's an interesting aspect also that Mary and Martha are there helping with this meal. Some have speculated that Simon could be the father of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We don't know that for a fact, but he lived in Bethany. He had a, had a home there, whether it's his home or maybe it's the home that they all lived in together. Now, we don't know that, but that's an interesting concept. There's a closeness there because Martha's doing the serving in Simon's home. So there's a connection there of some kind. Paul? The New King James next verse says, the one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. So. I think it's a different son. I think it may be a different Simon, Paul. I think that's the case in that, but that's a good point. We might need to research that a little bit too. So yeah, uh, good point. I think it's a, I think his was a different Simon, but I'm not totally sure of that. Uh, but interesting, interesting thought there. So here we see the context. They're there at a meal. Uh, and so uh, You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Uh, now, I share that con that parallel passage in Luke 7. John tells us he, she pours it on his feet. Luke tells us he pours it on his head. So we know we have passages that kind of add additional information to it. And, it said from, and they said the idea is from head to foot. Okay. It's just the terminology. One uses head, one uses foot. But, mo but the idea is she, she anoints him from head to foot. And this is the idea. Now, if she had just removed the stopper in this vial that she had and allowed just a few drops to fall on Jesus' head, those present would not have been surprised because that is what you would typically do when you anointed someone. And we know that, uh, uh, we know the idea is when you anointed, it was expected that you'd be anointed uh, from their head. Uh, and when Jesus was at Simon's home before, he talked about how you did not anoint my head when I came in. So it was a common practice as hospitality that you would anoint their head with just a drop or two of a perfume or something, just a soothing deal. But what she does is totally different. What does she do? 
it's not a drop or two. The whole thing. She breaks the vial and she pours the whole thing on his head and she wipes his feet with it as well. It's a full anointing is what she does. So because of that, we see here in Mark's account, while he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, reclining at the table, there came a woman with alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. It wasn't just a drop or two. She pours the whole vial on his head. So what's the response? Well, the response is Judas Iscariot that, that Paul mentioned. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore, Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, this nard was an expensive Here's how it's defined as I looked it up. Nard was an expensive rose red ointment imported from far off India, a mixture of oil and liquid perfume distilled from a rare plant. This is very expensive. And obviously he says it could be sold for 300 denarii. It's almost worth a year's wages, a year's wages. And so she takes this vial and pours it and pour not just a drop or two, the whole thing. A year's worth of wages. Joe? Uh, Randy, in this day and age, they didn't have CDs to put their money in. Yeah. Or savings accounts. Uh, expensive, the fact that he says this is an expensive perfume, this is her life savings that she's doing. You know, it's just, it's not a cheap bottle of. Dollar General store, you know, perfume. <laughs> exactly. Five for a gallon. Uh, th th this literally is her life savings, and she's given it to him. Man, that's a great point, Joe. Thanks for sharing that. We forget that, that, yeah, they didn't have, they weren't putting their money in it. This was part of where she put her money, wasn't it? That was her savings. Really great point, because it's trying to let us know this is a real sacrifice for her, isn't it? This is something that was very precious to her, that meant a lot to her, but she loves Jesus so much that she's going she's gonna to give it, she's going to use it uh, to honor Jesus with. Now, got some questions to ask you as we look at the rest of the text. But Jesus said, okay, now Judas, well, let's go back to Judas. We've been told, John's told us about Judas's character before in his writing. That Remember, John's writing after the fact and he'll tell us when Judas comes up, he'll tell us that he was a thief. Judas' heart was not where it needed to be. Judas' heart was other places. He didn't care about the poor. He cared about the funding. And it's interesting, I think in Matthew's account, it's right after this occasion that Matthew records, I believe it's Matthew, maybe John, that that's when it's kind of to the tipping point for Judas to some degree. This is when he goes off to the, to the leaders to to reach his greedy arrangement to hand Jesus into their hands. It's after these occasions and this waste, and he's responded this way. You just see the greed that's in his eye, in his heart, just not where it needs to be. But Jesus responds and says, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Now Jesus is not saying not to care about the poor, is he? Because he said, what about the poor? They're always going to be here. Yeah, you're always going to be able to take care of the poor. But what's the other side of that? I'm not always going to be here. I'm not always going to be here in physical form that you can do this for me. Now, we understand through the rest of the message of the Acts and the gospel message that whatever we do to one another, we do to Jesus. But this is your last opportunity to show love to me 
in a physical form that I'm here in front of you. That's what he's saying. And so, Greg? Do you think she realizes he's about to die? Or is this just a gift of love and appreciation in her relationship with him? That's my next question. You raised the question that I'm going to raise to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. What do we think her reaction is? What has Jesus done for her and her family? He raised Lazarus. Lazarus is sitting at this meal with them. Lazarus was dead, comes out of the grave. Jesus brings him out of the grave. And now they're sitting having a meal together. And Mary, we've seen Mary sit at Jesus' feet before, hadn't we? Remember when Martha rebuked Mary and told Jesus, Jesus, don't you care that I'm doing all the work and my sister is sitting here? She was sitting at Jesus' feet. And Jesus says, she has chosen that which is better. And so she has been taking in all this. She's been spending a lot of time with Jesus, but he just raised her brother from the dead. And no doubt, like Greg said, there's a lot of gratitude there, isn't it? There's a lot of outpouring of love. And we talked about this family was close with Jesus because he spent other times in Bethany that he came and shared meals with them and stayed in their home. There was a really connection. Now, what did she understand from the things Jesus said? Jesus had talked about his death, but most of the disciples, what? They didn't understand it. So my question comes back to what Greg said. Did Mary have a greater concept of hearing what Jesus is saying? Because we know how in tune she is with Jesus because she sat at his feet and she let everything go aside to really focus on things Jesus said. How many other conversations had she heard Jesus say, have, about what was going to happen to him? I mean, did she have better understanding? Had she really paid attention? Did she have some concept of what he was fixing to face? Jesus said, she's done what? She's prepared me for my burial. You know, why do you... Yeah, let her alone. She has done what she could. She's done what she could. She's, she's loved me. She's shown love just in a way that she was able to. And, and like Joe has said, she has given the thing that's most precious to her to try to show Jesus just how great her love is for him. She wanted to show a physical act. And so she gives the thing that's most valuable to her to show Jesus just how much she loves him. And how, and if she's conceived, con conceived the idea that he will die, that she wants to take this opportunity to do what she can. And Jesus says, what's he say? She's done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. I wonder what the others thought about that when he said that statement. We don't get a reaction, but we know they didn't really understand, but he's pretty pretty open when he says that, isn't it? Well, they thought, well, your burial, when's that going to be? I mean, maybe they're thinking, I mean, you know, they're not thinking it's going to be immediate, not just in a few days, but it's just in a few days. And that's why I think this act of love means so much to Jesus. And they're not going to get the chance to really prepare him. You remember the women come after the crucifixion to the tomb to anoint Jesus preparing, and he's already risen. So they didn't get the chance to really prepare him like they should have for his burial. But Mary takes the opportunity to actually prepare him for the burial that's coming. And you talk about what a great expression of love. Back to back to Greg's point. I, you know, I know it's a great expression of love to what the, she, he means to their family, what he's done to her for her brother to raise him from the dead. I almost, I almost have the idea that she has some foreboding concept that Jesus isn't going to survive this. They've seen all this ratchet up. They've seen the we, we've read about the the intensity of the of the attacks on Jesus after he raised her brother from the dead and he had to leave their town to go to Ephraim and now he's coming back to Jerusalem. She knows he's on his way to Jerusalem for the feast. I think she knows he's going right into the heart of the trouble. And I think she really senses he's not going to survive this. And I'm going to show him how much I care about him. Thoughts or comments? I was just going to say to me, it's the sense of jubilation. I'm sorry? 
a sense of jubilation. Jubilation. It's also anointing. So I'm just saying her, her yeah. celebration of bringing Lazarus back, but also her celebration of getting to be in the presence of God. Yeah, that's a great point, too, just being in his presence. Yeah, and the opportunity she's had. Other other comments before we close this morning? I think when we just let this soak in, you know, of a, such a great expression of love, and, you know, we think about how do we really show our love to, to Jesus? I mean, now we don't have him physically, but who do we have to show love to? One another. Well, one another, taking care of one another. You know, that's how we show love to Christ, is how we love one another. So just a great, great passage on love. We're going to deal with now Jesus will be going into Jerusalem, and, uh, and we'll deal with a lot of that that happens after that. So thanks for your great comments this morning and your attention. Oh, yeah, page numbers for next week. Uh, pages 248 to 252 in Volume 2 of True for Today. 248 to 252.